know, if you sneak over there and look, you'll see that hiding under there is another person playing because there's no way that one person can hit all of that at one time. I love to hear that play. If you will, stand and join me as we sing, Blessed Be Your Name.
submission of his request. I am my Savior and happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, if with his goodness lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. R.G. Lee, pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church for a long time, had told a story. I heard it as Adrian Rogers was recounting the story, and it is a very wonderful and powerful story about revival. R.G. Lee said at one time an evangelist friend of his was in revival over in Arkansas somewhere, and he was preaching revival, and he was preaching one service, and he noticed that up in the balcony there was one gentleman that was just overcome with conviction. And when the invitation started, he just knew that that man was going to come down out of the balcony and come forward and make a decision for Christ. He saw the man get up, walk out of the back of the balcony, and he waited for him to come back through the doors. And they sang three or four more verses, and the man never came in. A few weeks later, after the revival was over, he got a call, and it was from that gentleman. He asked the evangelist to come by and visit him. And the evangelist showed up and they were talking and the man was bedridden and uh, he had been diagnosed with cancer. And he said that uh, the evangelist asked him, well, look, the night that you were at the revival, I noticed that you were overcome with conviction. He said, sir, I was, I wanted to jump over that balcony rail and come down there. He said, what happened? He said, well, I got to the bottom of the stairs and I could turn left to come into the sanctuary or I could take a right and go home. And I decided to take a right and I went to the house. And he said, well, at least you told me about it. Now you can be saved tonight. He said, no, no, sir, I can't. He said, why? He said, because I made a decision against Christ and something died in me that night and I'm no longer feeling what I was feeling that night. You see, uh, some of the old time preachers call it when the lights go out on the road to hell. And I want you to know that I'm not saying that uh, any of you would have a fate like that. What I will tell you is in the midst of revival or any time that God is speaking to you, tugging at your heart, you better respond. If at any point during our revival, you feel the Lord convicting you or pointing you to do something, you better act on it and act on it right then. It's always best to do what the Lord is leading you to do because it is so much sweeter. And so I hope that tonight, as you have gathered here for revival, that the Lord would speak to your heart concerning your life, concerning whatever decision that it is that you might need to make or that he wants you to make. And I pray that you'll have the courage to be obedient and to what he's calling you to do. I'm so grateful that Brother Dean is here. Didn't you enjoy the worship this morning? Amen. Amen. And I really enjoyed it tonight so far. Brother Bob, it's an honor to have you with us tonight uh, and looking forward to the rest of the week. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of this, but each time we've been together, I've always loved to pick your brain about ministry and pastoral duties because you're such a blessing. And I'm just honored to have you here in our pulpit tonight. And so to God be the glory for that. When you leave tonight, there will be a love offering received. Now you can put it in the receptacles that's back here at the back door. Uh, we wanted to separate tithe and offering this morning from the love offering. But as you leave tonight, you can place them in the receptacles back there. And we're so grateful to have you here tonight for our revival. And uh, just hope that you'll feel the presence of the Lord here. 
and we're viewing, uh, we have our live streaming going on every service this week. If there's some of your friends that you want them to view the services, direct them to our website and they'll be cataloged on there and they'll be able to find revival services or if you want to rewatch. And also we're live streaming so that people are viewing us all over the United States right now as far as way as you know as Alaska. And so thank you for all of you who are joining us by viewing tonight through our live streaming and thank you to all of you visitors uh, some of you visitors were home visitors here and now we're back glad to have you with us tonight and so glad that you're all here let's go to our heavenly father in prayer and then we'll continue on with service heavenly father may everything that's done in this place tonight bring you glory and honor and may it serve to glorify you and further the kingdom of god lord touch the hearts of people tonight in the beautiful saving and all-powerful eternal name of jesus we pray amen you may be seated and we'll continue our worship with the ladies trio as they sing rescue There's no other name by 
you, ladies. Aren't we thankful that Jesus has come to our rescue? Amen. If you will, stand again and join me as we sing Jesus' name above all names. this song farther than your grace can reach and when I heard this song it it became the song that basically is a song specifically about me and one that is a prayer that every time I sing it it just touches my heart that no matter where you are in life or the circumstances that you've had in your past. When you come to Jesus, because his grace is not farther 
from us than what he can reach and we can reach to him. Amen. You pray as I sing farther than your grace can reach. each day with good intentions then fail you in a thousand ways but still you keep forgiving me of the same mistakes no fault Thank you so much, Brother Dean. Boy, that's smooth, wasn't it? Pericomo of the ministry. That's good. 
you young folks don't even know who Perry Como was. Okay, it's okay. You didn't miss a lot, but anyway. Well, I'm glad to see you tonight. It's a good crowd. and Well, I don't know how good you are, but it's a large crowd, and thank you so very, very much for coming. I hope you had a good afternoon. Boy, didn't we have a great lunch today here at church. I tell you, you have some wonderful cooks here. I don't know who made that broccoli salad, but if you're single, I'll put your name on a list. My, my wife is still living, but I keep a list. One day, if she goes before me, I'm, I'm looking for the best cooks I can find. Hey, by the way, if you have to miss, if you just have to miss a single night, whatever you do, don't miss tomorrow night, okay? I know it's Monday, but don't miss tomorrow night. And young folks, it's okay to come to Revival and still go to church the next day. So you come right on, but tomorrow night, you be sure and be here. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading in verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. If you have found it, say amen. Well, that's kind of weak. I'll give you another minute to look for it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. And I didn't get this to the folks up there. I don't know if they'll have it on the screen or not. All right, here we go, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. I live in Northwest Alabama. Some people hear that I'm from Muscle Shoals and they hear that word Shoals and they, they think I live down on the Gulf, but I don't. I live about as far away from the Gulf as you can be and still be in Alabama. I live in Northwest Alabama and uh, where I live, there are only two kinds of people. And I'm not talking about black and white or rich or poor or Auburn or Alabama fans. Where I live, the only two kinds of people are, there are city folks and there are country folks. All of my daddy's folks are country folks. All of my mother's family were city folks. Now, country folks are not any better than city folks, but you don't ever have to tell them that. And city folks are not any better than country folks, and you've got to tell them that over and over and over and over. But I like, I really do like country folks. I like the way country people dress. I call it a dignified simplicity. I like the way country folks dress. I like the way country folks cook. I don't like quiche and sissy food like that. I like country food. I like weenies and crowd and pinto beans and cornbread and mashed potatoes. And if you've got that at home, this will be a real short sermon if you'll invite me to come to your house. <laughs> you'll never go into a, anywhere in America and find a restaurant that advertises city cooking. But everywhere you go, you find restaurants that advertise country cooking. I just like the way country folks cook. And I like the way country folks talk. Now, country folks say the same thing that city folks say, but they just say it in a little different way. For example, a city woman carries a purse, but a country woman carries a pocketbook. City folks throw the heels of a loaf of bread away, but country folks know that the end pieces are the best part of the whole loaf. City folks drink whole milk. Country folks drink sweet milk. City folks go to the movies. Country folks go to the picture show. City folks go to mother's house. Country folks go over there to mom and them's. You see, they say the same thing that city folks say. They just say it in a little bit different fashion. All of my dad's people, as I said, were country, country folks. My great-grandmother and great-grandfather Pittman lived way out in the country, out from Florence, Alabama, which is up in northwest Alabama as well. 
I lived about 15 miles down the Waterloo Road. You turned left onto a gravel road. When the gravel came to an end, you stayed on a dirt road. And when the dirt road came to an end, there you were in that old, old house that they lived in. They don't build houses like it anymore. Part of the house was here and part of the house was here. Had a roof over the whole thing and a big hole all the way through it. People call those dog trot houses. They must have thought an awful lot of their dogs back then. God forbid they'd have to walk around the house. Just knock the middle out and let them walk right through. Now, there was another part of the house about 30 yards away, but we won't bring that up because it'll soon be supper time. But that's the house that my great-grandmother and great-grandfather Pittman lived in. When uh, Grandpa Pittman died, uh, a lot of the members of the family tried to get Grandma to leave that old house and come and live with them, but she wouldn't do it. She's been born in that house. She'd gotten married in that house. She'd given birth to all of her children in that house. And she was determined to die in that house. And, and eventually she did. Now today, when elderly people get down and really can't take care of themselves like they ought to be able to, there are a lot of places where they can go and be well cared for. There are assisted living centers and senior adult homes and retirement centers. And But when I was a boy, I didn't have that kind of stuff. Either you went in to live with them or they came to live with you. Well, she would not leave that old house. So I remember, even as a young boy, that our family put together a little bit of money and hired a lady by the name of Mrs. Fowler to go and live in with my great-grandmother. Now, Miss Fowler probably was about as old as my great-grandmother, but she could still get about, and she could still do some cooking. So she moved in to be the caregiver with my great-grandmother. Miss Fowler was probably the most unusual person I ever met in my life, and I was just a boy, but I remember her so well. She was a genuine, pure, country woman. And she was country before country was cool. I'm telling you. Miss Fowler wore, an old, wore her hair up in a bun, pulled so tight, I always thought if one hair were to spring loose, it would knock her down. Miss <laughs> Fowler, all she wore were those old flower sack dresses that she made with her own hands. Now, those of you in the Pepsi crowd, you don't know what that's about, but you Geritol gangers know what I'm talking about. They used to sell flour in cloth bags, and those bags came in colors and patterns, and if you saved enough of them, you could make a blouse or a shirt or a dress. And that's all the kind of dresses Miss Fowler wore were those old flower sack dresses that she'd made with her own hand. She always wore stockings, but she would roll them down beneath her knee. And every time she crossed her leg, you'd see that big brown rib of stocking there. It always tickled me, but I never laughed. I was afraid of her. <laughs> Miss Fowler did not wear any makeup at all, except for those two brown streaks that ran down both sides of her mouth. And I don't believe it was Avon, I believe it was Garrett. And for the Pepsi crowd, that's snuff, all right? Miss <laughs> Fowler could do something. I've never found anybody else that could do it. And if you can do, I've looked this crowd over, and I think there's a couple of you that might be able to do that. Uh, but Miss Fowler could curl her chin up and touch her nose with the tip of her chin. Now, she didn't have a tooth in her head, and that might help to accomplish that. And if you can do that, I wish you'd see me tonight after church. It, it would warm the cockles of my heart to see that again. Now, we won't do it out here in front of God and everybody. We'll find us a room somewhere and just you and me. But if you can do that, I wish you'd let me know after church tonight. Miss Fowler lived by a very simple philosophy. No matter what kind of day it was, she would always say this. Well, you know, the Bible says, Every tub shall sit on its own bottom. I didn't know what that meant, but Miss Fowler said it was in the Bible, so I figured it must be important. 
It could be a beautiful day with birds singing and flowers blooming and trees budding and sun shining. And she would say, well, you know, the Bible says every tub shall sit on its own bottom. Or it could be an awful day with tornadoes coming through and houses toppling over. And she would say, well, you know, the Bible says every tub shall sit on its own bottom. So I grew up believing the Bible said every tub shall sit on its own bottom. Didn't know what it meant, but Miss Fowler said it was in the Bible. Well, I have since come to discover the Bible does not say every tub shall sit on its own bottom. The Bible does not say that. I preach, you know, it doesn't. I, uh, I preached at the Northwest Florida Baptist Evangelism Conference some time back, and, and I shared that story about the every tub shall sit on its own bottom not being in the Bible. And after the service, a, a lady came up to me. I guess she was about 85 or so. But as best I can remember, she was about four feet tall, about four feet wide, and had two teeth in her mouth, one up and one down. And she waddled up to me and pointed her finger right in my belly button. And she said, sir, you told a lie tonight. I said, well, ma'am, I surely did not intend to. What did I say that wasn't true? She said, you said the Bible does not say every tub shall sit on its own bottom. I said, oh, no, ma'am, that's not a lie. That's not in the Bible. She said, oh, yes, it is. I have read it for myself. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. My wife and I, we've been married over 50 years now, so I don't date much anymore. But uh, you go home tonight and you find that in the Bible and you come back tomorrow night and you show me that. And you and I are going to paint Panama City red. I will go to any restaurant your teeth can handle. We'll go to the movie. We'll do whatever you want to do. You just find it, bring it back and show it to me, and we'll go out tomorrow night. She said, well, you just get ready. <laughs> and as she walked away, I thought, oh, God, I hope that's not in the Bible. <laughs> well, she came back the next night, and she was so discouraged and you could just look at her and know her feathers were, were wilted. And she said, well, preacher, they just don't print Bibles like they used to. <laughs> well, the truth is the Bible never did say ever to, hey, I did find where it came from. If you've ever read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, in Pilgrim's Progress, there's that little phrase, every tub shall sit on its own bottom. I still have no idea what it means, but at least know where it came from. Sometimes we think the Bible says things that it doesn't really say. For example, uh, Brother Bob, you know, the Bible says that uh, God won't ask you to do the impossible. Oh, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. That's quite a lot to ask of a man been dead for four days. You see, God will ask you to do the impossible, but he always gives you the wherewithal to accomplish what he wants you to do. Well, Brother Bob, you know, the Bible says God helps those that help themselves. No, the Bible doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that God helps those who cannot help themselves. That's how you and I got into the family of God. We could not save ourselves, therefore he saved us. Well, Brother Bob, you know, the Bible says charity begins at home. Well, that's, that's usually quoted by people that don't want to give to the evangelist love offering. <laughs> but the Bible does not say charity begins at home. Well, Brother Bob, you know, the Bible says uh, God works in mysterious ways as wonders to perform. The Bible does not say that. William Cowper said that in a poem. Well, Brother Bob, you know, the Bible says, uh, spare the rod and spoil the child. No, the Bible says, he that spareth the rod hateth the child. And that's very different. Sometimes we think the Bible says things that it doesn't really say. Now, you may have never heard any one of those little pithy sayings that I just ran through. Maybe you'd heard all of them. 
But I'm going to give you one more. And I promise you, you've heard this one. You've heard it over and over and over for years. You've heard this one. And not only have you heard it, most of you in this room believe it to be true. But it's not. And most of you who believe it to be true know you can find it in the Bible in a matter of moments. But you'll be wasting your time. It is not in the Bible and it is not true. So I'm fixing to say it, and once I say it, do not say amen. You've heard it, you think it's true, you think it's in the Bible, but I promise you, it is not in the Bible, and it is a lie, it is not true. So don't say amen. I've warned you twice. Your own ignorance is at stake. We think the Bible says, but it doesn't. We think it's true, but it's not. This little saying, God won't put more on you than you can bear. I can see some of you kind of sprinkling up right now. Some of you are getting a little milk. Brother Bob, I learned that at my grandmother's knee. I don't care where you learned it. I'm telling you, it is not in the Bible, and it is not true. It is not true that God won't put more on you than you can bear. Now, some of you are thinking about a verse over in 1 Corinthians that talks about temptation. And the Bible says there in that verse that no temptation shall ever come our way, but that God will provide a way of escape. You see, some people say, well, Brother Bob, I sinned, but I couldn't help it. Yes, you could. God always has a way of escape. But now a temptation, hear me now, a temptation is an enticement to do evil. Nobody tempts you to be good. You're tempted to do evil. And when temptation comes, God will always provide a way of escape if you'll just seek him. But in 2 Corinthians 1, Paul is not talking about temptation. He's talking about trouble. Trouble. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning the trouble which came to us in Asia. Trouble. And so I want to talk to you tonight very briefly about the truth about trouble. First of all, I want you to see the reality of trouble. Now look again there in verse 8. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning the trouble which came our way in Asia. Now Paul does not tell us what the trouble was. And that's very unusual. Because usually when you read the epistles of Paul, when he's in trouble, he'll tell you what that trouble is. He says, on five different occasions, I was whipped with a scourge. A scourge had a handle about 18 inches long. And flowing off of one end were nine long leather straps, often called the cat of nine tails. Embedded in those leather straps were pieces of bone and rock and metal. So that when they came down on your back, not only did those leather straps whip you, those particles embedded in the straps would rip the flesh on your back. Paul said on five separate occasions, he was whipped with that thing, 40 stripes less one. That means on five different occasions, they hit him with that thing 39 times. And all of that together, that means that that scourge, that cat of nine tails, had come down on his back 195 times. If we could see the back of the Apostle Paul, it would look as though he had gone through a meat grinder. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. 
He says that Lystra, I was stoned with stones and dragged out of the city and left for dead. You see, usually when Paul is in trouble, he tells us what the trouble was. But whatever this trouble was, it was so awful, he doesn't even tell us what it is. Oh, it had to be worse than those five scourgings. It had to be worse than the beating with rods. It had to be worse than the stoning with stone. Whatever it was, he said, I just want you to be informed. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know that when we were in Asia, we were in real, real trouble, worse than anything we'd ever had. The reality of trouble. My best friend in the world went to heaven in January, Brother Junior Hill, one of the greatest evangelists Southern Baptists ever, ever had. And Junior says concerning trouble, he said, either you're just now coming out of it, or you're just now going into it, or you're already in it. Trouble. The book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. The oldest, I don't know of any scholar that would debate that. Job is the oldest book in the Bible, and Job said this. He said, man that is born of woman. Now, hey, you'd have to think a long time to figure out another way to get here. He said, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. The reality of trouble. The second thing I want you to see in these passages are the intensity of of trouble. Listen to what he said. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning the trouble which came to us in Asia. Now notice this, how that we were pressed out of measure. What does that mean? Pressed out of measure. In the language of the New Testament, that's an idiom. That means it's a, it's an, it's a picture phrase. When you, when you read it, you see a picture in your mind. It's a picture of a little donkey. God made donkeys, amen? They don't grow on trees. God made donkeys. And God did not make donkeys to be house pets. If you've got a donkey at home in your house, then you just need help. There's just something wrong with you. I'm sorry, I don't, don't mean to be unkind, but you're just not right. God made donkeys God made donkeys to be beasts of burden. And a donkey will stand in place and you can pile the weight on and pile it on and pile it on and he won't buck and he won't bray. He'll stand right there doing what God made him to do. But eventually, you can put so much weight on that little donkey, the bones in his legs will begin to shatter and then they will begin to crumble and he will go down neath the load. That's what it means to be pressed out of measure. Paul said the trouble that came to us in Asia absolutely crushed us. Don't tell the Apostle Paul God wouldn't put more on him than he could bear because he experienced it in Asia. He said we were crushed. The trouble was so intense it crushed us. And then he adds this little phrase in that, ver in that verse 8. He says, above strength. Above strength. That means it robbed them of all of their energy. You know how we Baptists are. We got a slogan for everything. Man, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Just suck it up and keep on trucking. Paul said, listen, I'd sucked up everything I could suck up. The truck died. There was nothing left. We were totally spent, totally wasted. The trouble just robbed us of all of our energy. There was nothing left. Paul said we were crushed and left without any strength. And then he adds this. He said, in so much that we despaired even of life. Have you ever been in despair? Do you know what despair means? The word despair means to lose all hope. Paul said the trouble that came to us in Asia, oh, it was so awful. 
It crushed us. It robbed us of all of our strength and took away all of our hope. Now, I cannot overemphasize how big a deal that is. If I were to say to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that I have lost all hope. You're nice people, and you would say, well, Brother Bob lost his hope. That's, that's sad. Where are we going to go eat after church, you know? But when the Apostle Paul said that he lost all hope, that's a very big deal. Because in the New Testament, Paul is the Apostle of Hope. You see, as Christians, we're people of hope. We have hope, don't we? We have hope. As Christians, we're people of hope. But we have that hope because Paul wrote about it in the New Testament. Almost, not every time, but almost every time you see the word hope in the New Testament, it's there because Paul put it there under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul said more about hope than James did or Peter did. Paul said more about hope than Jesus did. And when Paul said the trouble that came to us in Asia crushed us, took away all of our strength, robbed us of our hope, I'm telling you, that's pretty intense. But I want you to see one last thing. We'll have our prayer. Not only does he talk about the reality of trouble and the intensity of trouble, he says, I want to tell you why trouble comes to the people of God. Why do bad things happen to God's people? You know, it's not hard to explain why bad things happen to to bad people. It's not hard at all. You see, it's not hard to explain why, why a drunk ends up being killed on a highway. That's not hard to explain. It's not hard to explain why somebody who's on drugs, that they end up dying a horrible death. That's not hard to explain. It's easy to explain why bad things happen to bad people. But why do bad things happen to God's people? That's what verse 9 is all about. He says, but we had this sentence of death. Now that phrase, the sentence of death, is the way he summarizes verse 8. He says, while we were in trouble in Asia, the trouble came to us, it crushed us. It took away all of our strength and robbed us of our hope. And he says, it was as though God had passed a death sentence on us. That's what he said. We had the sentence of death in ourselves that, in order that, we should not trust in ourselves. Oh. Oh. Brother Bob, do you mean that that great man of God, the Apostle Paul, he had a problem trusting in himself? That's exactly what he said. It's exactly what he said. You see, sometimes, especially those of us who live here in the South, it's sort of, it's sort of ingrained in us from the time we're born. Hey, you're tough. You're big. You're strong. You're man enough. You're woman enough. You've got enough creativity. You've got enough ingenuity. Anything that comes your way, you can handle it. You can work it out. And God says, well, let's just see if you can. And trouble comes. And it breaks us. I was a pastor for 33 years before I became an evangelist. During those 33 years, there were a number of times when people would come to my office and say, Brother Bob, I have come to the end of my rope. And my response was, good. They didn't like that. 
They didn't want to hear that. Brother Bob, you did not understand what I said. Oh yeah, I understood what you said. You said you have come to the end of your road. And I said, good. Well, why is it good? Because if you've come to the end of your rope, that's where God's been waiting on you to get. As long as you thought you were tough enough and smart enough and wise enough and man enough or woman enough to figure it out and conquer it, God will let you try. But when you come to the end of your rope, that's where God's been waiting for you to get. You see, beloved, it is not true. It is not true that God won't put more on you than you can bear. What is true is God won't put more on you than he can bear. Jesus made one of the most amazing statements in the New Testament when he said this, cast your cares on me because I care for you. That is an invitation from Jesus himself to cast all of your burdens on him. Next to the time you got saved, listen to me, next to the time you got saved, tonight can be the greatest night in your Christian life. It can. If you're carrying around some kind of a burden and it's crushing you and you don't know what else to do, Tonight, you can get rid of that burden. You can let it go. You can bring it to this altar. Some of you, it's loneliness. God, the loneliness. I just can't bear it anymore. Some of you, it may be a wayward son or a wayward daughter. Some of you raised your son or your daughter in church. Maybe this church. They were here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And now they're out in the world, could care less about things of God. They never go to church. And you cry yourself to sleep every night. You are carrying a burden God does not intend for you to bear. And he invites you, bring it to him. An old, old song, Brother Dean, I hadn't heard it in years and years and years. It says, if the world from you withhold of its silver and its gold, and you have to get along with meager fare, just remember in his word how God feeds the little bird. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. The chorus says, leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you'll trust and never doubt, God will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. And that's the invitation tonight. And I'm as serious as I can be. This could be the greatest night in your Christian life. You can walk out those doors lighter than you were when you walked in. Because you walked in heartbroken and carrying a weight, carrying a burden that God does not intend for you to carry. And tonight, if you'll just bring it here, Lord, I've done all I can do. I've come to the end of my rope. I can't fix it. I, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you. Well, Brother Bob, if I walk down that aisle tonight and I give this burden to the Lord, does that mean in the morning when I wake up it's all going to be fixed? No, it just means in the morning when you wake up it's not your burden anymore. It's his. And he invites you. 
God will never put more on you than he can bear. And he wants to be your burden bearer tonight. The truth about trouble. Are you ready to unload? Now, some people just enjoy their burden, and if that's you, then just go on home with it. With it. But I'm telling you, that's not what God wants for you. God wants you to have joy and peace. God wants your life to be abundant and fruitful. And you don't have to be weighted down with some burden that you can't really do anything about. Lord, I've done my best to take these verses and open them up and apply them. And Lord, this is, this is revival. Lord, this church set aside this time to have revival. And Lord, lost people can't be revived. They can only be vived. They can get saved. And I pray if there are lost people here, they will get saved tonight. But, Lord, only Christians can be revived. And so, Lord, if there are some here tonight, and obviously there are, you would not have led me to bring this message. So, Lord, if there are some here tonight that are just beaten down, almost without any hope anymore, because of some burden, because of some trouble, some weight in their heart. I pray tonight they would bring it here to you and leave it here. Lord, don't let them pick it up and take it back to their seat. Lord, let them bring it here. Leave it here with you and then watch you work. And we'll give you the praise for all you do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready? I'm telling you, this could be a great night in your life. And this could be a great night. Are you ready? We stand together, we sing, and as we sing, the altar's here. You come right now. Come on right now.
Ooh. Mm-hmm.